ערב טוב לכל החברים של המכון תרבות איטליה בחיפה. הערב תהיה לנו הרצאה מדוקטור סיז ליסקיו. זה המפגש השלישי מתוך הסדרה מסע בהיסטוריה של האופנה בסגנונות. הערב השם של ההרצאה באיטלקית Le regole del made in Italy, the rules of made in Italy. אז אנחנו מודים לכולכם שהצטרפתם להרצאה שלנו ובבקשה אנחנו ניתן לדוקטור סקיו להתחיל את ההרצאה. לפני זה רציתי לציין בסוף ההרצאה תהיה לנו אפשרות לשאול שאלות הם בעברית או באנגלית או באיטלקית, אפשר גם לכתוב בצ'אט, אפשר לתרגם לדוקטור סקיו ונשמח, נשמח הצטרפותכם בדיון. פרגו דוטוריסה סקיו. Thank you very much, thank you for this introduction, thank you for being here, also for this third appointment. Let me share Uh, my screen so we start with this uh, presentation um I would like uh, we are uh, in our third uh, appointment I'm very glad uh, of uh, this journey of having have the possibility to take on and bring you around in more than thousands years of um uh, Italian history and European, as we said, and, and uh, also in intercontinental history of textile and fashion. I would like to thank uh, the Italian Cultural Institute in IFA for this hospitality and uh, the person of the director, Mar Maria Sica, which suggested and invited me. I'm very glad to have had uh, the opportunity to make this uh, cultural exchange with you. And uh, as uh, um, already anticipated uh, by this introduction, I would like to um, welcome all your comments and uh, your questions, thoughts, uh, or just uh, ideas regarding what we have said, as already specified, but would like to repeat. So you're very welcome to use the chat if you want uh, and, and write down your questions, uh, comments, uh, um, point of views uh, regarding in any um, English, Italian or Hebrew, uh, any language, so that we will take care at the end of this uh, um, connection, this uh, uh, lecture. We will have uh, a first presentation that we'll have uh, more or less half an hour, and it will be a review of what we have done so far, so that we sink in uh, what we have introduced in the first two um, uh, um, appointments, and above all, that will be instrumental and very important to then moving forward and to understand the new phases, so the, what has happened in the 20, 19th century and uh, 18th century, 19th century. Uh, so around this, the, the last two centuries of this uh, Italian cultural history and economical history. Uh, after this first phase, uh, we will have five minutes, a uh, few minutes, maybe just two or three. Uh, I will switch to an, another um, presentation and that one will be focused on the Italian uh, made in Italy birth. 
So what, where does it come from? Which are the historical events that prepared and uh, which are the personalities around uh, and which are, um, how do we ended up with so many, um, uh, such a broad and stable uh, production of um, fashion that has the leadership since uh, more than 70 years uh, uh, globally. So let's begin and, and move uh, and look back uh, so that we um, which uh, we, we take uh, a, a little bit uh, of uh, review of what we've done. As we see, we have gone through the major histories of uh, Renaissance and the Middle Age from the Italian textile produ production point of view, which make it, made it possible for um, um, nations or, or uh, duchies or, or um, cities, uh, republics uh, to become among the most powerful economical identities uh, and realities uh, in, in the uh, world Europe and in the uh, between the Middle East and, and the Europe with a strategical power. Here we have the picture of Eleonora de Toledo, which was the wife of the uh, Grand Duca uh, of Toscana, uh, Cosimo, Secondo de Medici. And they are both displaying uh, some of the most beautiful uh, uh, textiles and dresses uh, ever made in the history. Uh, of the um, um, recent history of textiles. Um, these were produced in Florence and uh, the fact that they are wearing them, it's uh, their way to in, be entitled and display the power and the primacy uh, of this production for the Florentine Republic, uh, uh, for the Florentine uh, nation, Grand Ducato, and for um, their relationship towards the outside world, because uh, at that time, and we are in the early, in the first half of the 16th century, it seems uh, 200 years uh, that uh, both Tuscany, Venice, uh, Genoa, Milan, um, and other Italian cities, they were all developing this crucial presence in the, um, uh, in the uh, um, European uh, world. No, now I, yeah, nah, it goes on. Uh, the kind of textile we're talking about are beautiful velvets, silk uh, with uh, laminated gold thread uh, with different cream, uh, crimson, black, uh, um, blue, uh, the look, most luxurious colors, each of them had a very huge impact uh, economical because it was not as easy as today to create a, a very brilliant and, um, and, uh, and stable colors. So both the design, both the technicity, the, the uh, difficult, uh, um, uh, the intricateness of, of this uh, um, Yes, yeah. I have difficulties in moving forward with this. Uh, yeah, let me see if, yeah, now it's moving. Um, the cities of Italy based uh, their wealth uh, in the production of textiles, in the commerce, commerce exchange of textile. They were uh, amount, uh, they were um, discussing or moving toward the north of uh, uh, Europe to sell and, and buy and display uh, with um, and make exchange and businesses with the uh, uh, monarchies uh, in the north of uh, or in the rest of Europe, but not only there, but also in, in, the, uh, in the area of the Middle East. So they were really in the center of this uh, very intricate net network of routes where the um, Anseatic routes that were the ones ruling uh, and, and engaging the north of Europe, they were then exchanging with the goods from Venetian, Genoese, Venetian, uh, and uh, other routes that were coming from the Middle East. And from Constantinople, that was then the ancient name of uh, um, Istanbul, 
it became a, a necessary in the 13th, 14th, 15th century, um, whether before it was the place where the uh, textiles, precious textiles from Asia were coming, so from China, from India, from the Middle East, from the 14th, 15th, 16th century, they were doing the other way around. So they were buying huge quantities of the most, uh, um, um, of this kind of textiles that were developed also with some patterns that were um, usually appreciated in, in Asia. And because the uh, Italian um, craftsmen, they became uh, weavers, they became as uh, uh, specialized uh, and skilled that were not able to be copied. So uh, only them, they were able to create as intricate and special textile as this one. We will see that uh, uh, we have seen that the cities also displays, if you go through Florence or many of the medieval Italian cities, we still have the names of the um, areas uh, of the districts that have still uh, this memory of the production of textiles attached. So well, as well as uh, the amount of wealth uh, that was accumulated uh, throughout the centuries uh, by families and by corporations of craftsmen, um, uh, they made it possible for uh, uh, the Italian cities to be built to have these monuments because they were investing in directly in the uh, building churches, building uh, um, places for the wealth of the community to be displayed. Uh, so the entire Italian uh, society was thoroughly built and uh, uh, profound, not, not only the cities, but also the landscape. The landscape had a lot of connections, uh, a lot of, so it's where a wool or linen was produced or, or where a, um, a, um, we have seen last time a lume di rocca, which was this alum a mineral that was extracted uh, in areas between Genoa and Tuscany. And it was fundamental for the major colors like the red, dark red or dark blue to be fixed. Like this guy, different tones of, of red that we see. Uh, this is again Eleonora de Toledo with her son, uh, Cosimo Garcia, if I'm not wrong. And she's wearing a purple violet uh, um, dress and uh, manteau cape, as well as her son, he, he has a very brighter red. These are both uh, uh, tones that came from the same uh, dyeing color, very precious, kermesy or grana. But uh, uh, according to the amount, the, the uh, succe successive uh, amount of uh, uh, color and, and uh, um, bath that the textile was re receiving and the amount of alum, uh, alum, these minerals and, and the passages, they, it was releasing a different tonality. But this was ex exactly the same. We can appreciate the decoration in gold around uh, the borders of this uh, dress and, and um, Canvas, these are also dresses from you know, on the left uh, in a velvet dress uh, in a, uh, that is attributed to Eleonora de Toledo that was found in, in, uh, in Pisa. I'm showing it because it displays this decoration in gold uh, in the borders. And this shows how um, the uh, contemporary fashion was uh, seen, the decoration of uh, the way it was constructed the clothing, and to a point that then we find it distributed all over Europe because the portraits and uh, other surface, other, the fashions at the time was moving from the Italian courts, from the Italian republics, from the Italian uh, networks toward the other European uh, courts and uh, royalties. So they, they all wanted to be dressed and to be seen as they were, had seen some decades before on the same decades. Uh, here we see the uh, King Vasa, 
uh, um, uh, Gustav Vasa became the king of Sweden in the 1523. And uh, he, uh, together with, uh, um, with him also, all another display of European um, uh, um, kings, queens, uh, daughters, they were all, of course, marrying each other and diffusing by uh, that way their fashions. One of the major fashion influencer one can imagine at the time, it was uh, Caterina of Medici, again, coming from the family, Florentine family Medici, and she became uh, the queen of France, and hence uh, in, in inspiring and bringing with herself. So this uh, distribution of fashion was moving around towards, uh, through the commercial con contacts, so the movement of uh, a businessman that were moving uh, throughout the territory, but also most importantly, by the movement of these monarchies and, and these uh, um, uh, circus, uh, monarchy circus that was moving constantly because of the relationship being shift. Another way to move uh, fashion at that time was also uh, it defined, as we have seen, by the first, the early publications uh, that resemble to books, uh, where in the 16th century, um, it begins to be uh, portrayed the different way, the different fashions all over Europe, but also in the world. So even the Ottomans, if, here we see a, a, a woman from Matrona di Firenze, a, a woman from Florence, and we see how it was in Cesare Vecelio. It was uh, um, interesting for those who bought this kind of publication to see how people were, were wearing the clothes uh, throughout the different regions of Europe, throughout the different regions of Italy, because Italy didn't exist as a nation. It was all split in different uh, in different. Uh, uh, states uh, and under states and republics. Uh, but also uh, you would find in these books uh, Ottoman dress uh, or near Indian dress, uh, the early, um, um, oh, it, it, it was a kind of an essay on ethnicity somehow also. And uh, sometimes uh, they were portraying also people from uh, the middle um, class uh, or lower class uh, and sometimes displaying these different social differences which is made them incredibly interesting for us uh, to study and then we came uh, to we are uh, at the moment uh, in the middle of the 17th century which means uh, 1640 more or less uh, when uh, the king of france uh, we, he, which is the one portrayed uh, standing uh, on the right side of the big, this picture is portrayed now receiving these uh, three black men on the left side kneeling down these are three emissaries from Genoa and they are um, there trying to please the uh, French king and, and to stop invading or bombing so there was a dis dispute outside Genoa and so they were uh, one of the many um, uh, disputes uh, around the maritime possibility or passage uh, in the, in the uh, sea of genoa toward uh, toward france uh, but what do they do they go there to diplomatically discuss a uh, uh, military topic but wearing the most uh, impressive black so the black of genoa was uh, since a uh, couple of centuries uh, the most impactful and uh, uh, and luxurious black all over the world. So when you see that still today or at that time you have all this uh, uh, intelligentsia, so notaries, uh, um, intellectuals, uh, uh, most of it uh, clear, cl clerical people or uh, the black displayed nobility or um, the uh, the status, the highest status, and uh, hence the, with the black, uh, one could have um, 
a very difficult textile to be produced because it was not like today I'm wearing a black shirt, but it is produced in a chemical way. So we uh, are back in the time to have the black as deep, as brilliant and uh, in silk or uh, in other material, even in wool, but this is the matter of silk, uh, silk velvet or silk um, uh, damascos or other other plain or uh, silky textiles. That was extremely difficult to be obtained and it was extremely um, uh, costly. So it was, a, it made the textiles in, in black the, among the most luxurious uh, goods. And the Genoans, uh, the Genovese knew that very well. So uh, when they go there, they discuss and they are dressed in this beautiful black that then it was uh, the matter of uh, this business. So they obtained what they wanted, but even they obtained a business deal for the uh, the, the selling of uh, an amount of, of textiles to the French um, royalties. After that moment, uh, not immediately after this uh, occasion, but um, uh, the King of France then decided uh, short after that he, he was spending too much money buying textiles from Italy and from outside. Uh, so that's why in that moment they um, founded not only uh, the textile production and manufacturers in Lyon, so the French manufacturers uh, to produce uh, internally textiles for the French court, but also they, for example, they uh, he installed the Manufacture de Gobelin, so where all also another display of goods like the por porcelain or the production of furniture. So everything was decided to be um, uh, produced uh, inwards. So, uh, and it, it's a huge uh, uh, definition, a very modern um, way to approach. Uh, uh, that made France uh, from the 17th century to the 18th century, uh, a kind of sort of leading um, a leading uh, uh, nation. Uh, the the uh, court became the one that everyone around uh, in Europe and outside was looking at when it turned to fashion novelties. And that remained uh, until the late uh, or the early, so the First and the Second World War. So by this way, we make a, a huge a uh, jump because in in a certain way we leave what we left uh, uh, in the 16th century uh, it, Italy at the time we have a couple of centuries the 17th and 18th century where Italy is completely dominated and and has a lot of uh, problem problems so the fast uh, and the uh, entrepreneurship that was displayed during the Renaissance is somehow incubated or or um the um, deflated temporary but we see that it's still there it's, it's it kind of remains in the territory for the moment when uh, it will become available and necessary this is exactly what we are starting to look at now so by the end of the 19th century so around uh, the time when Italy became a unified nation. Uh, Italy became unified in 1860, 1870s. One can consider that Italy becomes to feel itself uh, like a territory, uh, somehow working together with a national identity. And by the end of the 19th century, then also many um, of the nobility, many entrepreneurs, they become aware that they, they have, there is a strong potential and possibility to um, work um, back and to support and to bring back the knowledge that the, the Italian territory had that was based on the textile production and on the production of uh, diffused uh, fashion goods. So while at the beginning of the 19th century, while everyone was still looking at Italy, at Paris, at France for each and every year, the news and the novelties, some of the um, 
there are some few movements that made it a uh, shake is shaking up and, and and creating some basis and we are going to follow up till the second world war for example there are some quite many companies that are still existing today like crespi which is an industry that was uh, uh, well they say that uh, they um were born so the foundation dates back in the 1797 um, but actually it is between the middle of the 18th century 19th century that it becomes uh, uh, as big as uh, defined as uh, we know it but uh, there are archival materials where, where it shows that this production was still already in the area of Piemonte which is between Milan and, and Turin uh, and it is a production that since uh, uh, centuries has uh, focused on linen and cotton. Uh, and it is at the base, we see that there is be beside the Alps. And it was at the, in that time that was uh, beside the Alps, many uh, industries were developed because it was uh, uh, possible to, it was discovered um, the, um, what is called the water, so electricity produced by water power, uh, because uh, um, moving water uh, from the Alps uh, made it possible to have the turbines and and then automatize uh, the production of the the industrialization of the uh, looms in these uh, industries, um, and um, and that made it also possible that this huge complex uh, were not only modernizing the way the industry was being produced but also the uh, uh, enlarged the community so they were most of the time huge uh, agglomerates which uh, made it necessary for to have people moving towards which made it possible for the people moving and living around the industries to have good, uh, uh, better housing, because it was directly the ownership, or the owner of the industries that were building good uh, um, housing and then maybe uh, creating other uh, structures, above all, uh, taking care of the territory like giving stability, building streets, uh, um, creating these uh, power energies structures that when then be taken over by the Italian states between the First and Second World War as the then the nationalized uh, power um, uh, structures. Um, many of the uh, these entrepreneurs, textile entrepreneurs, were very um, 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 how, how do you call them, uh, very enlightened figures. Uh, they could see through the necessities of the uh, community. And many of them, they became politicians. They became the ones that were first uh, senators uh, during the decades before the First World War. And many of them continued also between the First and the Second World War. So they were like uh, Crespi, they were involved deeply in the birth of a modernized Italian society. Uh, many of these uh, structures are still in place. This is, uh, for example, manufacturers uh, that has been turned into a museum for the history, for the history of industry, and where you would have uh, not only families would receive a home, they will have a kindergarten, they will have schools and theaters, uh, um, recreational um, places, and also some had uh, swimming pools uh, for the, their workers. So they were incredibly modern. For some um, other, as we said, uh, if you know about the Northern Italy, you have the Alps that create like a crown toward Italy. So if you move from Piemonte to, to Milano, and then you move uh, toward Venice, you will reach uh, uh, Bergamo. And Bergamo is the siege also now they're quite close to the uh, Alps. Also, then you have uh, Valseriana in Albino with Cotonificio Albini, which was focused uh, on uh, cotton and the production of the extremely uh, beautiful cotton textiles. So if you 
are interested in nice uh, textiles from Italy, mark down these names because these are still the wonderful, beautiful producers and uh, um, in each on, on, on the categories that I will talk about. So, and uh, so from a moment, a, a, a display like we see the, the picture above where uh, the production of textiles was still in the middle of the 19th century in a way that was uh, far away with poor people that were trying to keep with bad, uh, poorly uh, uh, cleaned uh, environments uh, with the health that were not being taken care. Then it became a more industrialized, a more um, a to totally modernized uh, way. So where also social categories were taken care. And this, this was above all for Italy, but in, at large also for Europe was a very innovative way to take care of the company or of the society. So then it was, uh, as we said, uh, the linen. And just to have an idea, and uh, is a date that is a little bit later, if we want to have a perception of how steady, how um, hyperbolic was the development, just to count from 51 after the Second World War to 76, the textile companies in, in Italy has grown in a tremendous uh, um, fraction. So the, in, just in Prato area, Prato is around Florence, uh, the number of, of uh, companies goes from 787 to 13,566, which is amazing. Then we have, for example, silk production. And I wanted to have, we've seen how since uh, the Middle Age, silk production was the pride of the Italian or the, um, the blinking eye of the Italian production because it was where all the, um, um, the knowledge of the primacy came from and also the economical uh, uh, relevance that made uh, for centuries Italy uh, the center of this trade. When we talk about textiles, we see textiles uh, after the 19th century, we need to think about one area in Italy, which is the Como area. Uh, a little bit on north of it, uh, Milano, you have the lake of Como. Como is the center for the Italian production of uh, silk, even today. And uh, one of the major companies is Mantero, which is still uh, um, the one that works with uh, the other brands. So when we speak about the Italian silk, so it, it means that uh, most of the time, silk in Italy is still both abroad, so it's still both from uh, Asia or India and other countries. It's rarely produced in, in Europe any longer because it doesn't um, extend, so it's, it's not uh, uh, possible for the amount of production that is necessary, but it is being weaven and, and uh, um, so uh, been spinned and weaven in, in Italy. Um, by some of the uh, major producer are, is this Mantero or another is Ratti. And when you are see silk production from even French major companies, it's mostly possible that it is produced in Italy, but then attached with uh, uh, an external, a, a different um, branding uh, because Italian companies still produce and work uh, in the Middle Ages uh, or in the Renaissance, uh, Italian textile weavers were doing commissions for uh, the kings and queens uh, from all over the Europe, and now they do it. Uh, they still do commissions and, and brand for brand uh, from abroad. And these are examples. When it turns to wool, we have another huge part of the Italian production in textiles, which is uh, developed and, and is still burned and, and, and is still, um, it still came out of the dust at the end of the 19th century from is, uh, looking back from the past traditions. And this is uh, the, in the area 
again in Piemonte, close to the mountains, the Alps, in Lanificio Ermenegildo Zegna e Figli, is um, between among the most prestigious uh, producer of wools, cashmere, and vicuña, and pre uh, this kind of uh, animal uh, of all animal origin fibers. Uh, Lanificio Ermenegildo Zegna has a huge archive. It dates back of 200 years and is the one that has uh, had uh, this responsibility to really take on a huge quantity of Italian community in the part between Milan and, uh, and Turin as well. As Crespi, we had seen it was a little bit lower in the plain, but Crespi Ermedegildo uh, Zegna is really up in the mountains and is still there. It's a beautiful um, uh, place and then it has developed, uh, you see, the, the uh, industrial um, uh, installment is uh, very close to the mountains. There is no just behind. It's because they, then they could use the electricity from the water pipes that were just built behind. And this is the founder. And as we see how illuminated it was their approach back then already at, at the end uh, or at the um, passage from uh, the 18th century between the 19th century, uh, 19th century between the 20th century, they were already building theaters. They were already building um, swimming pools for their workers because they thought that uh, people with the right mind uh, and they could uh, uh, um, have recreated and restored their bodies and their minds, they would work uh, better. And that was certainly one of their uh, they made them unique you know, still today. Um, once we go with, through the stories of these companies, we can also uh, participate and com uh, comprehend or see how the whole global business of the wool, uh, of wool matters work. Because actually today there is something that uh, with the sustainability of clothing uh, is being discussed very much, which made it uh, uh, so much uh, uh, shameful that, for example, in Europe, I don't know around there in, in, uh, in Tel Aviv, in Israel, how it is, but uh, just being the fact that uh, almost every single there's no possibility in Europe to reuse or to use the wool that is being produced here by a ship. So it's just been burned, just been thrown, uh, and no one is using it. That is due to the fact that uh, um, between the 19th century and 20th century, the big companies like also Emergillo Zegna, for sure, they created a huge um, network globally where they would buy in stock um, and they would decide where to buy in stock the wool at the beginning of the season every year and that has been decided that it would uh, become this is the world map where it was decided so now it is decided uh, that uh, wool is being uh, both and it, it's coming so the market of uh, origin is australia cashmere is in tibet mohair wool is from South Africa, and vicuña and alpaca is uh, from South America. And that is uh, uh, somehow um, kind of, uh, sorry, there's someone, yes, that has to be, yeah, it's done. Um, so that has made uh, this structure quite uh, rigid and impoverishing of the all the differences that the different wools around the world can have. But somehow this has also has uh, um, favorized, so has made it possible to breathe and to move toward uh, the most uh, luxurious uh, textiles ever made uh, in, in wool. And this is uh, how the Hermenegildo Zegna has been working since 50 years, um, giving trophies, uh, so prizes uh, to the producer of the most uh, the lightest, the, the most uh, sophisticated light uh, fleece, uh, which means the wool uh, around the world. Um, for the same reason also, um, 
this is an, uh, an extract from an article of 2014 where it says that Hermenez Gildo Zegna, which is named as the powerhouse uh, uh, textile to means men's means men fashion, powerhouse Hermenez Gildo Zegna advanced its position in the fashion field uh, by clinching the majority stake in Australia actual superfine wool farm. What does it mean? Does it mean it means that that year uh, in 2014, uh, Erbene Gindel Zegna had both uh, all the super fine wool uh, being produced all around the globe, uh, which of course made it, um, oh, it seems uh, somehow um, uh, not so smart <laughs> today uh, in the fact that we reflect uh, so much on, on the, uh, sorry, uh, on the sustainability of the fashion production. Um, moving, I'm sorry, I have sometimes my computer that is blocking. So let's move. Um, Hermene Gillo Zegna has, uh, um, of course, the female collection, which is called Agnona, that was created. If you want to check it, it has ex extremely classic, uh, um, wool uh, um, cashmere pr products uh, since the 50s. And uh, another element that is uh, uh, interesting is about the sustain uh, the support that these companies like Hermene Gildo Zegna, but also another one which you're going to see now is Loro Piana, they made an agreement, which is the International Vicuña Consortium in 19. 94 alongside the Peruvian government and to and the local communities that were breeding and and uh, uh, farming these animals the vicuña the consortium has granted uh, the honor of returning the fiber to the market because for some years this fiber the vicuña had stopped to be produced because of the rarity of the animals it was not possible to be introduced any longer in the market and could legally count on their revenues deriving for shearing as long as they pledge to protect the animals from poaching. Thanks to this action, the vicuñas have been protected and saved from extinction. By the end of the 80s, no more than 500 animals remained, and today the total is more than 150,000 animals. So, some of the goods of the business trade at this global level has uh, an impact also at the end line, but it's not that they, uh, so often that it happens. Loro Piana is another uh, company that is working at the highest level with uh, both the wool and cashmere fibers and also this vicuña that is uh, among the softest uh, and the most pre precious uh, wool and uh, animal origin um, um, textiles and fibers. Now, let me uh, just interrupt this because uh, I have to change um, uh, the group and make an organization of my uh, group. Um, I see here a question, Suo Villaggio Crespi. Um, Maria Silvera, uh, would you like to ask me uh, to, to specify more? Uh, do, what would you like to know about Villaggio Crespi? I don't hear you. Just put on your microphone. Thanks. It's down here. Chiedi di attivare audio. You should put on your microphone. Sì, se può attivare gentilmente il microfono. It's on the... Yes, Maria. Perfetto, perfetto. We hear you. Non so per quale motivo era sparito. Era sì, sparito sì. tutto. E mentre parlava di Crespi, mi sono ricordata del villaggio Crespi. Sì. E allora eh, che avevo visitato anni fa, allora mi chiedevo se era quel credito. È quello, è quello, esattamente quello. So now Maria Silvera eh, was asking me if it was, uh, when we talked about uh, the company Crespi at the beginning, the one with this huge establishment and it was an industrial, uh, an early industrial uh, implant from the end of 
the 19th century with red bricks and uh, very nicely decorated. Uh, today is called Villaggio Crespi and thank you Maria for have, giving me the opportunity to specify because you can visit it. It is um, a very nice uh, area where you can become a tourist in a little bit of a, a bubble uh, and voyaging in, in the time back uh, more than 100 years in the life of people that were never, I imagine, thinking to become uh, so famous. So there is a lot of pictures, a lot of stories about uh, those men and families uh, working there, females, a lot of women working there. Thank you so much. So I'm coming back in uh, a couple of minutes just to change. Uh, yeah. E anche un esperimento di villaggio, un esperimento di avvicinamento agli operai. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It was a social experiment. It was a very illuminated attitude by the entrepreneur. Uh, so that they invested so much, but they got back so much. And of course, uh, it not, it's not by chance that um, the owner, then he became a, a politician, an Italian politician, a instrumental sen senator. Uh, it's because these are visions uh, that basically made uh, their um, uh, division, how the society should look actually uh, at large. Uh, but then... Uh, well, in Italy, we have had uh, quite many illuminated uh, entrepreneurs. Another one is uh, Olivetti, Olivetti, even in Piemonte. So it was not far away, but it was uh, in technology, engineeristic uh, ambient. Let me get back to you as soon as possible. Just a minute. So here we are back. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So uh, we were discussing about this passage between uh, the beginning of the 20th century, so before the First World, First World War and the Second World War, um, the um, the Italian uh, situation is, of course, uh, dramatically impacted by the events uh, uh, related to the um, to the First World uh, uh, Conflict, and it made it uh, uh, dramatical consequences. Uh, and above all, uh, in the relationship and in the ways uh, Italy saw itself uh, um, through uh, the lens of. Uh, how uh, fragile the community had displayed, been impacted, of course. It was a trauma, a collective trauma throughout all Europe. But then above all, in the, um, in the societies, uh, in the highest society, like for 
uh, noble aristocrats, uh, intellectuals. Uh, there was a way to reflect and to try to recondition and redefine where the, to position itself. And uh, it was in this uh, um, pattern that uh, some of the, comp the magazines, uh, contemporary magazines were born, like Lidl. Lidl is an interesting uh, experience. It is a magazine that uh, was founded uh, and was active between 1919, so immediately after the, the First World War, and until uh, 30 35. So in between the, the two uh, conflicts. Uh, it was in um, a title is a reference to the founder name, which was named Lidia Dosio de Liguoro. And it was uh, a magazine that, even though it was discussing about illustration, readings, drawings, uh, works in English, uh, but also about elegance and about style and about. Uh, intellectual relevance, Italian intellectual relevance. So the magazine played a significant role in the birth of the Italian fashion, because it was two decades of discussion of intelligentsia rolling and, and reviewing their identity. And it provided a platform, whether before it was not there. Uh, at the same time, it, it has to be um, declared that it was also a place where militant, because it was part of the intelligentsia, so some of the fascist ideas, uh, they were also displayed and discussed, because at the time between the two world war, it was difficult uh, to tear apart. Like today, we have many streams uh, in the same cultural um, position, so sometimes it, it, it became really uh, contradictory sometimes. But Lidl, uh, anyway, was launched by this journalist, uh, a female, Lidia Dosio de Liguoro, and it was published in a monthly basis. It instilled a sense uh, of uh, national identity. It was uh, targeted toward a, a group of uh, bourgeois women, uh, not only in, in Milan, where it was based, but also throughout Italy. It was in Italian, and it was employed. Uh, it employed fashion to promote the idea of modern Italy. I can uh, maybe show it. It, it has had uh, beautiful um, covers, a wonderful impact in the graphic design, the birth of graphic design. There is also um, many collaboration, like uh, with the illustrator like Gruau Gro, and then also. Uh, you can see how modern it was, the difference. So from the first years, years 1922, and these ones I think is 27 or something around mid 20s. And here is the 34. How uh, elegant, how advanced uh, the, um, not only the graphic design, but also the allure and the discussion. And of course it was the way for, uh, the upper class to display their might, their visions of the Italian society, how they should look. And some of the covers are really wonderful and they can, um, some of the cover page also monthly featured works by Bruno Munari. I don't know if you know uh, him, Bruno Munari then later became one of the major Italian designers. At the time he was working as a graphic designer for this as a first uh, activities as being young. And we will see uh, how, uh, for example, in Lidl that we have, here's it between in the middle of the 20s, the Rivista Lidl is then also promoting how the elegance today should be attached, uh, of course, with a new lifestyle. La Nuova Ballilla is the production of the Fiat. So our uh, um, traveling with planes, uh, traveling with cars uh, and the new elegance uh, was really communicating and moving and, and want to bring ab about the identity of an Italian community society that was wanting to, above all, to emancipate from the uh, grip of the French 
couture, the French uh, allure. So there were a lot of articles in the Lidl and a lot of promotions and discussion. We should use our textiles. We should not go to France to look at the fashion defile. We should uh, just watch uh, and uh, breathe our uh, uh, sartorial knowledge without going, because in this way we can support uh, and uh, reinforce uh, the industrial, the, the Italian industry, the Italian society and poly politics. In this way, it was, as we will see in a while, uh, the Italian fascist uh, politicians and Mussolini, it was understanding uh, that the potential and, and the impact of the fashion, Italian fashion, if it was supported by, by the state. Uh, we will also understand that identities like Elsa Schiaparelli are all outside uh, outsiders uh, from the main uh, history bag. So Elsa Schiaparelli, we see he, her here pictured in an amazing pair of pants in 1938. It was incredibly modern. They were done in Jersey, which not, was not even a, a textile that was uh, considered female or urban. It was like with Chanel, they were using it uh, normally at the time only for sports or for, for example, to go to the seaside. It was not, Jersey was a, a flaccid, flexible, not textile. It was not considered a textile. It was considered like, um, uh, uh, without tone, a textile without uh, tenure. But she doesn't mind because she was uh, an incredibly um, uh, out of the ordinary woman. She was uh, uh, out of a uh, um, uh, well-off family uh, where the mother was an aristocrat, the father was uh, uh, a passionate of Sanskrit and history of the Middle Age. Uh, bro one brother was a astronomer. Uh, he, another one was a Egyptologist. So this variated background made it possible that she had an incredible upbringing and uh, she became really one of the moves of the Dadaism, of the surrealist uh, area. He, she was a uh, very close friend with Salvador Dali, with Jean Cocteau, with um, uh, what is uh, the um, Man Ray, she assisted Man Ray with this Dada magazine, Societe Anonyme. She was friend with the Gabby Picabia. Uh, Picabia was then do, um, the uh, uh, woman of uh, France Picabia. So she was, uh, of course, uh, she felt that uh, the Italian society, so Milano, was not there. Uh, uh, was not enough for her to uh, bring out all her energy. And so she moved uh, between uh, USA and Paris. Of course, during the Second World War, she moved to uh, USA uh, for major parts. Uh, but she opened her uh, fashion house uh, in the 30s uh, and 40s uh, in, in France. And that was all a sequence of very surrealistic and unique um, uh, pieces of uh, incredible um, uh, art like this shoe at in 1933, 33, so 33, Dali was photographed with his wife, Gala Dali, with one of her slippers, so one of her shoes, ballasted on his head. And in 37, he sketched the design for the shoe hat for Schiaparelli, which she fe featured in the fall winter. 37 uh, 38 collection. The hat is shaped like a woman high heel shoes and the heel is standing straight up. So she was also wearing it, but also this, uh, uh, it was, it became a sensation. Other, so most of the pieces that made uh, Schiaparelli iconic at the time, they were out of, uh, straight out of surrealistic uh, paintings uh, or movies uh, or Dadaist uh, installations. On the left, we see what is called the tear dress, a slender pale blue evening gown printed with a Dali design of trompe l'oeil, rips and tears, worn with a tight length veil 
that um, with the real tears. So we see we see here the color and the. It doesn't look like uh, uh, light blue, but it's because of um, a failing color uh, placing uh, in the computer. It's 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 actually light blue, and then it is uh, this uh, like pieces of flesh of. Um, skin being teared down like teared down from uh, the surface of the of the dress so that the dress become the skin becomes a, a kind of a terrific memento mori it was uh, it is said that it was uh, created uh, in uh, uh, produced in response to the spanish civil war and of the in response to the spread of fascism and declaring that the tear of the dress is to the knights its customary decorum and utility and to question the matter of concealment and revelation of the garment so of course it was full of a lot of uh, double double meanings another very famous dress is the uh, lobster dress together with the color that was uh, the pink, uh, the fuchsia pink that was, uh, is her trademark. Another element that made her um, incredibly known is the use of materials that were not uh, uh, like um, luxurious. Uh, so she used plastic, she used uh, cellulose, celluf uh, cellophane um, tools uh, that were not uh, precious at all to make um, majestic hyperbolic uh, jewelry like this one, but also many others, and sometimes also bad taste or some some very shocking elements. And she collaborated a lot with the films and the movies, made in made in costumes for movies that were, of course, a part of this uh, um, Dadaist uh, or surrealistic vague. <laughs> we have seen that the uh, fascism was uh, understanding during the de those decades, uh, the impact and the, the necessities that uh, the, the potential that fashion could have in the construction of a new uh, contemporary modern um, progressive Italian society. So uh, the intuition is that um, fashion not only can support a new identity, but can unify, can create business, can create uh, economies, can create work, uh, and can um, support and structure um, the Italian society from inside. That was also a progress our way, and an incredibly um, um, positive vision that made. Uh, the fascist uh, politicians uh, and the personality of Mussolini also understand that the role of the uh, Italian women could be enhanced and support by the display of an Italian fashion instead of the French one. Of course, uh, uh, the fascist man Mussolini with this imperial identity and vision didn't see positively the fact that Italian fashion was copying uh, uh, every year every season, the French uh, fashions, and uh, because that created a bad um, uh, industrial circle. So what it was uh, also um, installed by uh, the militarization of society is that it was created a base for a, a diffused, uh, also in families, in circles, in villages, in, 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 in small cities, uh, the production of uh, uniforms, the production of uh, different elements of uh, uh, accessories. So that made it possible that the society at large, even through schools, the foundation of schools for, um, uh, we see also mainly women or girls that received the formation to become good uh, seamstress, uh, they were becoming part of an industry that was uh, structuring itself. And uh, in that way, let's go faster. So another very important passage was the understanding that uh, the Italian society had uh, uh, an history uh, uh, connected with the production of textiles. And at that time, it was just uh, 
moving up and bubbling and, and being discovered new textiles, so synthetic and artificial fibers like lanital and uh, um, again lanital, but also snia viscosa, for example, rayon, snia viscosa, the viscose. So these were all textiles that, that were produced by state installed uh, industries. And that was just in the moment uh, that where the fascism understands that uh, in, um, investing in these uh, economies uh, can make, uh, um, can project uh, the Italian state immediately toward uh, the leadership in uh, in this industrialization. So if we see in the Snia Viscosa reclam, uh, we see also that is uh, not only the names of their brands, so Rayon, Snia Fiocco, Lanital, which are the names of the fibers, uh, but also there we have a, a sculpture uh, loosely referring to the Roman times, and it, it means the textiles of the empire, because of course the fascists, uh, uh, fascist man had uh, as a project to uh, regain, re reproduce the empire uh, fast. As uh, uh, yeah, we, we see also in this uh, Leoman Lanin, uh, the textiles of the empire, uh, and then so we have of course uh, the. Um, uh, the, uh, the dollar, so the the um, the blank page of the uh, um, bloody page of the Second World War. So years have passed, uh, um, disrupting the Italian society. But as far as soon as the uh, Second World War is over, then it becomes clear that Paris is going back to the. Haute couture. Haute couture means uh, a production that is only addressed to one per kind production, customized, uh, is tailoring, is not high productions, is not produced in quantities, is not produced in a way that can be exported. And this is what something that the Americans wanted to have at the, sec at the end of the Second World War. Uh, they were Americans, but also the Northern country, for example, Sweden, that had, didn't have any impact. Uh, so it was a country that was ready to move and boost on, and also UK. So all the major department stores, they were looking for places where to buy amounts of, mo of fashion that was ready, divided into different uh, sizes that could ship, shaped uh, and uh, delivered every season. France was not ready for that because it has concentrated in, of course, the higher top class uh, fashion, which was uh, the haute couture, but it was not able to provide a mass produced, uh, mass produced, a huge number of production for fashion models. And that was the mid, the small, uh, the territory, the district of Italy, thanks to the present and the support of the uh, many textile companies, thanks to the vision and imports or, or, or the experiment throughout the Second World War. Here we see a defile where not many buyers, for sure, they were there. It was, uh, we see a lot of military people there showing. So we are at the end of the Second World War somehow, but that was a way to uh, ramp up the the uh, the identity and and then to create what something that could then as soon as the second world war was over uh, and then create a position for the italian fashion we have uh, some examples in the fashion magazines where the italian fashion was referring to be publicized uh, abroad to the fast and the identity of the arts of the past centuries. So a way to reproduce uh, and to, um, to photo shoot uh, uh, Italian fashion was uh, uh, including all the elements in uh, beautiful um, uh, historical classical uh, pieces of art. And then we arrive at uh, 1951. This day, this year, 1951, is the date that normally is referred to the official birth of the Italian pret a -Porté. The man we see on the left is uh, Giambattista Giorgini. He is considered the father 
And the one, uh, he was an aristocrat from Tuscany. He was living uh, in Tuscany, but also between the two world war, um, uh, wars, uh, he was uh, still moving and traveling a lot toward uh, not only USA, Canada, Northern uh, Europe, and uh, having an understanding how the, um, what the people with the money would want uh, those uh, and what were they were appreciating of the Italian uh, um, past, the Italian taste, the Italian um, unicity. And as soon as the Second World War was over, then he understood that it was uh, um, he had built a lot of connections and he had friends uh, between among the uh, Bergdorf and Goodmans, uh, uh, all the uh, major buyers. So he did one thing in, uh, uh, what was that? It was in February, uh, 1951, invited them, sending him an invitation with this uh, um, uh, Raffaello uh, painting on the top. So I direct La Dama Lunicorno, the unicorn, Dame with the unicorn. And uh, he was directing then referring to the our fast, our uh, beautiful, um, uh, past. And in that first historic fashion show that he directly as a, an aristocrat, he was not an entrepreneur, he was just uh, interested in promoting and building uh, network and strategies. So he invites to the Sala Bianca. Uh, first, in the first year, actually, the first very first uh, defile, he invites them all in his residence. But as soon as the su success of the first historical defile, then he's been moved uh, in the Palazzo Pitti, which is the one, if you have been in, in Florence or are going to Florence, don't miss to visit the, the Palazzo uh, Pitti in, in Firenze, which is the residence of the Grand Duca, Grand Ducato. And is, uh, it was then historical also, it became, because in the 51, it hosted then on until uh, a couple of decades, it hosted all the defiles for the Italian fashion. Um, in the first uh, lineup, the atelier that participated were Germana Mar Marucelli, Ferdinandi, Capucci, Antonelli, e Fratelli Carosa, Giovannelli Sara, e Polinoro, then Sartoria Vanna, Giovenziani, and then also 16 sportswear companies and boutiques. This is uh, quite interesting. So there was not a, an official defile. So buyers or people interested in fashion, they were going to Paris uh, since uh, decades, since uh, the years, uh, and they were visiting the atelier uh, personally or during the defile that they were, but they were handpicked uh, and uh, it was very enclosed. The idea of uh, Gian Battista Giorgini has been to invite all his friends and some others uh, that basically they were like, for example, representative of Zuckerman, Hannah Troy, Neyman Marcus, Macy's, uh, Harrowitz, uh, uh, Among Parish, Amos Parish in New York, or others that were Erin Morgan in Montreal, uh, in California, other buyers from Chicago, Boston. They were from uh, Berlin, per even Paris, uh, and from uh, Stockholm, Nordiska Compagnie, from Amsterdam Plaza. So they were all from all over the world, department stores, buyers, and they were coming there to see that there was a fashion it, from Italy that could be both in large quantities and in amounts. And that made also a, a relevant, uh, Eff, uh, efficient economical uh, uh, positivity because it was produced uh, at a lower price uh, because thanks to the fact that the textile producer were in the territory and they were dealing and, and watching. So there was a dialogue, a tight dialogue uh, throughout all the district uh, in Italy that made uh, the possibility for the Italian uh, um, territory to respond uh, with such a steadiness and stillness to the um, 
Yeah, to the request of the new world. And it's incredible, like, I don't know, you may have heard of Oriana Fallaci. Oriana Fallaci is one of our major, uh, now she's gone, but uh, a writer, journalist, she's been a, a huge uh, um, fighter. But uh, at that time in the 50s, he, she was invited to talk about uh, this defile. And of course, she's uh, also underlining, you see in the picture above and on the right, is the young Sarto, uh, Roberto Capucci. Capucci would become, uh, in the decades, in following decades, one of the major uh, creative minds uh, of the Italian fashion. But at that time, it was not even um, major, because uh, at the time being uh, uh, 20, and he could not display and sell personally. So he was still a young boy, but he was still there, or again, already there because he was so um, well um, do it. Uh, and uh, he was displaying and he made a huge success. So when um, in, in this article, a long article, a two pages long article, uh, we see that uh, what they say, um, uh, we have the La Scarpa. One of the things that uh, uh, this, uh, in, in any other um, país, in any other land uh, of the world, it is possible to find, like in Italy, article of what is called boutique. By boutique, they mean uh, to, that you can buy also shoes, uh, hand, um, uh, handkerchief, uh, um, small elements of textile, Bijutries, um, jewelry, uh, and uh, um, accessories of any kind. This industry is typically Italian and uh, has uh, the possibility to procure to Italian um, areas, to the Italian sector, millions of in, in income. So by the turn really of the second, so by uh, a couple of years, uh, this uh, uh, fashion shows at uh, the Sala Bianca became uh, uh, rages. So they, they are the places where everyone wants to uh, wants to be. And uh, of course, we see Gian Battista Giorgini here with the US ambassador in 53, because of course, then it becomes um, a place where diplomacy is being made because it becomes so important. Among the names that we have seen invited in this uh, uh, events uh, at the Sala Bianca, we have seen Germana Maruccelli. She was, uh, I would say, the most prosaic, so practical version of the Lisa Schiaparelli, which was surrealistic and uh, super um, intellectual. She was also a very intellectual personality. She was uh, able to combine all her knowledge uh, and also co context uh, because she was also giving, um, uh, anticipating um, fashion. So she had a very huge knowledge. She was also dressing uh, a huge um, um, uh, actresses like Ava Garnand, as uh, we see here. And she is wearing a, 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 a dress that is inspired by, it was called Fraticello, the little friar. And it was an avant-garde in figurative arts. Uh, and she was also promoting intellectual uh, meetings. So at her home, uh, the Thursdays, uh, there were cultural meetings where authors, uh, literate uh, artists were meeting. Uh, in uh, 1948, Maruccelli collaborated with the painter, painter and setup designer Pietro Zuffi for a collection inspired by surrealism. In the same year, she was appointed production and advertising consultant of the textile company Nia Viscosa. Do you remember Nia Viscosa? So that was founded by the fascist area is still there after the second world war and providing support. So then thanks to this position, she was then able to take over an atelier in Corso Venezia in Milan and where she opened her new atelier and, and in 50 in the 50s she founded and financed the poetry prize um during the 60s she's still active and she's among the ones uh, working with opticals uh, and uh, for example with this uh, uh, incredibly modern uh, like a la courage 
clothes. Uh, among the ones that were not invited because they maybe preferred to display their production alone, it was Sorelle Fontana. Sorelle Fontana was an atelier based in Rome, and they were uh, incredibly active and incredibly known thanks to their relationship to the fact that they were dressing the goddess of the cinema, like Elizabeth Taylor, we see it above on the left, or Linda Christian for her marriage with Tyrone Power. This made this uh, um, um, sartorial, uh, Sorelle Fontana, they were four, if I'm not wrong, and they were based in Rome. And of course, the proximity the, uh, with the Cinecittà, with the new movies being produced, uh, made them close to the VIP saw so that they became uh, photographed and published uh, on the magazines so all over the world. Uh, and this made them also known uh, quite much as uh, the names of the haute couture, the French haute couture. Another name which was uh, quite famous at, the time, famous at the time, but it might not have been so known today is uh, Schubert. He was uh, not the Thai uh, um, man, but he was uh, an incredibly do it. He was uh, what is was said once it as uh, Dolce Vita. The concept of Dolce Vita was invented by Fellini for his movies, but then it was also storytelled by Flaiano, a scenographer and a, a literate, an author, and then it was dressed by Schuder, Schubert, which was uh, defined the tailor of the divas and the queens. Uh, and he, we can see him, and he was, of course, very much uh, a personality in, in the Roman uh, uh, kind of cliché Dolce Vita. Uh, here we see him portrayed uh, on the, um, on the uh, right uh, with the Magnani. Our one of our uh, most uh, beloved uh, actress. Um, talking about movies and how they can boost and, and uh, uh, contribute to the development of uh, uh, fashion in the 20th century, then we have the story of Ferragamo. Ferragamo, uh, which we see him portrayed uh, in the 20s with, uh, uh, on the set of a movie. Uh, in USA. He was from Naples, he was from uh, Italy, and he had learned how to create shoes from the craftsmen uh, with Italian tradition. And uh, very poor and very young, he moved to uh, USA and he started to work uh, in the huge implant, uh, shoes implant and production that were being constructed in, in uh, here we see Massachusetts, yeah, uh, so the show factories, uh, uh, of course, made it not a, um, uh, it there was not a buffer, not place for Ferragamo to display his uh, uh, vision, his uh, identity, his knowledge also, the, uh, what he had learned uh, how to treat and use materials with a, such a sophisticated and an elegant way. So what he did, he, he did move uh, at a certain moment toward California, toward the the, the birth where it was uh, coming up and coming uh, uh, movie industry, and he started to understand the impact of the collaboration with the movie stars for his. But then at a certain moment he came back. He came back to Italy and he based. Uh, his production on the, uh, we can move on and see, on the relationship with the um, movie stars where he could, uh, he was able to, let's see if I have a picture. Yes, a picture of all uh, the Greta Garbo, Clara Butluce, Rita Hayward, uh, what we see, Ingrid Bergman, uh, Sophia Loren, uh, you name it, uh, Greta Garbo again. So she, he had all the shoes, all the feet in his hands of the major uh, divas uh, in the movies. And uh, through that, uh, he could uh, then dress and, and create this. It's a very famous uh, 
model rhino rhinoceront he was using um no, new modern uh, contemporary materials like these nylon threads or also what he was using during the second world war was uh, in the age of uh, restriction so when the second world war was uh, in um, reducing the possibility or the availability of, of leather of other precious materials then it, it turned to raffia and to straw and also to um uh, what is it sugero i don't remember uh aha uh -huh. cork uh cork or wood somehow and this is cellophane is a thread of uh like a needlework of uh, of cellophane and as a collaboration <clears throat> a collaboration it's a point of contact with the identities that also schiaparelli was uh, was working so schiaparelli was working with the transparency of uh, uh, rodofan and rodofan was also used in these shoes by a uh, uh, um, ferragamo that was uh, transparent on the sole and uh, Yes, and, and, and that it was made them um, uh, quite unique in the history of shoes, uh, shoes making. Other names that came out of the times uh, was Emilio Pucci, that was instead uh, the master of uh, um, uh, printed fabrics uh, typical of the 60s, is also based uh, from Florence, but then collaborates with a lot of the companies like the silk producer, like Mantero and Ratti that we have seen in Como. And all these uh, printings and textiles are still there in Como in, in many of the archives uh, of these companies. Um, and also he was among the first to have success in the up and coming sportswear, uh, as we call it. We have, let me, shall we finish with Prada's history uh, so that we uh, go through the story of Prada, that is this uh, powerhouse uh, of the brands, uh, international brands, but in, in origin it was founded in the 19th century, um, well, the beginning of the uh, 20th century, so 1913 in Milan. It was uh, here, when you are in Milan, besides the Como, you have the gallery, also there in the gallery, there was this uh, small entrance, which is still the same if you go to Milan, it's still the same vitrine where then they have developed a huger. And it's a beautiful magazine. You can go there and, and it's a very nice, yeah, you see also the picture here and what uh, they were selling actually was uh, um, like Hermes, like Louis Vuitton, like Gucci, Fratelli Prada, they were creating um, um, luggages for traveling for people that were, of course, of uh, had a lot of uh, means because those who could produce and buy their luggages uh, and moving maybe with transatlantic uh, uh, shipments, then they were people of the VIP. So that's why all we can think about like Louis Vuitton and Metz also, they were so close then to the people that then, and then developed clothing because it was a way to understand uh, the cost, uh, the attitude of their customers already. So in 1919, uh, uh, the Prada uh, family, they were already providing and they were officially um, uh, leverantors, how you call it, suppliers of the, uh, of the monarchy, Italian monarchy. Some of the milestones of these, uh, um, well, huge, there's no way to uh, introduce Prada any longer because of course you know about, but what is uh, interesting is that until the 50s, uh, uh, Prada has remained uh, a strict uh, leather goods uh, um, producer. So it was accessories, it was uh, uh, made, so the clientele was the Milanese uh, up, uh, um, uh, well-off uh, bourgeoisie families uh, and they were not uh, a huge brand known abroad. What happened is after the Second World War there is from one side the introduction of this nylon pressions uh, as silky textiles but still is not as much introduced. The main turn is when the daughter in the 77 after having spent uh, 
a lot, many decades of her life uh, traveling, moving, and studying history of art, uh, meeting with uh, Jeff Set uh, around the world. Then she settles down and in the 77 accepts <coughs> to run the family collections, to run together with the, uh, with the husband. And this makes the turn. This makes her, um, but still it takes a little bit of time. It's not before the end of the 80s when she has the idea to have and revolutionize the, uh, and have a collection that can be displayed. And she was actually very much connected uh, with uh, the world of art, contemporary art whether instead uh, the art fund was connected uh, with the world of uh, sportswear. So they both were challenging and moving further the knowledge, the craftsmanship of the brand toward the first uh, in the 50s uh, and in the 80s, this nylon silky textile that guaranteed uh, a huge amount of economical uh, uh, possibilities. And then it was then, uh, again uh, reinvested and it came back in, in a vision uh, toward the accessories and toward fashion then. Uh, instead, the husband, Patrizio Bertelli, he was the one investing in the sports. So, uh, for example, in Luna Rossa with the uh, Louis Vuitton cup, uh, he was uh, very much involved uh, in this, and this guaranteed uh, a lot of um, success for the Prada brand, for, above all for the Prada sports. So it's among the first uh, and most successful uh, um, examples of fashion being linked to uh, uh, sportswear uh, endeavors and challenges. But above all, what makes Prada unique, uh, above all, or um, comparison is the foundation the activity of Prada as a contemporary art uh, mover and uh, mecenate. Uh, Fondazione Prada, if you happen to be in Milan, don't miss to go and visit Fondazione because it is an incredible place, uh, both from the art uh, architectonical, the way uh, a very boring place uh, in, in the city of Milan has been turned into a very uh, majestic and, and incredible place. And in a, it's a screen uh, for the, uh, um, for the, um, uh, for the most contemporary uh, uh, advanced uh, innovative artists to be displayed. I am sorry. So I had also a lot, uh, uh, quite so, to talk about Gucci and others, but uh, I am afraid I don't want to let you um, run over time. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, if you want to write them down, as I said in April, then we will have uh, a kind translation or someone that will help us. Is there any question that will pop up in your mind or also some suggestions? No. Oh, thank you so much. Grazie mille to every one of you. It's been beautiful. Thank you for the presence, the attention, and for this opportunity. I'm very honored. Thank you. Anche noi dell'Istituto Italiano di Cultura ringraziamo la dottoressa Schio per la sua serie di questi tre incontri che ci hanno fatto viaggiare nel mondo e nella storia della moda in Italia. Tradizione vivissima che rende il nostro paese famoso nel mondo. Modim le kulchen, che itzaraftem la sidraso, che le shloshami fgashim, yachadim dottor Schio che otano la maslul aroch ve che la historia che la ofna che l'Italia ma sho che anachnu mukarim le kola be kola olam siman mukar che la tarbut che lano quindi ringraziamo di nuovo tutti e tutte di nuovo dottoressa Schio grazie 
Ai prossimi incontri con, con l'Istituto Italiano di Cultura. Buonasera a tutti. Buonasera.